Hey everybody, Aaron from the Impatient Gardener and I've got a little bit of planting to do here. So Roy Diblick just left and he was here helping me translate the plans that we've been working on together since I think December or earlier um, for this moderately sized garden or maybe even modest sized garden uh, into what you see here. So I would say First of all, if you haven't seen the video on Roy's channel where we're laying out these plants and he's talking through how he translates that design on paper onto the ground and we end up with this, just stop and head over there first. Link up here and in the description for you to check those out. Because for me, that's where everything comes together. So we've been talking about a lot of theoretical things in this series so far where Roy came for you know the site plan and then we talked through the design and then he finalize the design and by the way it changed even a little bit since then and then we end up with this and i think the key thing to know is that we've done a lot of bleeding areas into one another here so there are lines painted on the ground here but the plants don't stop at that line they they ebb and they flow and they bleed into each other a little bit so I'm going to get planting here because obviously um, I've got all the planting to do. I do have my power planter auger and I think we're going to fly through this pretty quickly, but I'm on my own for this. But I just want to walk you through where some of the plants are first because we um, didn't really talk through that specifically in Roy's video. So let's just talk through that first while we get this planted. So I'm going to go wide angle here because I think it'll help you get a feel for the entire garden. Um, as we walk around and look at the little plant groupings. This area is almost entirely just Dyschampia gold top. Beautiful tufted hair grass. It's beautiful. It gets these um, lovely little clouds. It's very light and ethereal and moves around. Uh, it's a really beautiful grass. Um, gold tau is a little bit for, more forgiving in terms of condition than some of the other ones. So that's why we went with gold tau here. Down here we've got um, a blue lobelia. This will seed around and that's fine. It'll actually seed its way. It'll float in the water here and just hopefully seed its way along the banks as we go here. Um, I actually have some of that growing upstream uh, in the garden that I did uh, last year, the year before, I think I added them last year. Um, so it's a beautiful little native. It'll be, it'll be great. Okay. Next I'm going to move up to this corner. This is one of the bigger planting areas. This is Salvia crystal blue, which I believe is a proven winner's variety. This is a type of limonium, basically a big flowered, uh, sea lavender. So that's mixed in here. And there's a few little alliums dotted in here, which lead us to our little allium area. The alliums are Spring Beauty and Shorty. Shorty is uh, one Roy discovered at Northwind. Northwind, by the way, is Roy's perennial nursery, which you can shop at. It's located in Burlington, Wisconsin, and that's where all of these plants came from. And he's got some really cool different plants um, rather than your everyday run-of-the-mill stuff. So the salvia kind of sneaks up back there. Then we get down here, and this area has a white echinacea, Coryopsis golden showers, a kind of a tall skinny grass, and uh, and that's all basically mixed in as we go all the way over here. Down here, Roy threw in um, a couple of things that weren't on the original plan, including a uh, Nepeta subsessilis and uh, some Sanguisorba upright, another north wind find. Roy finds these things growing as seedlings and has a trained enough eye to spot them. It's a very upright growing uh, Sanguisorba. I'm very excited about it. I love Sanguisorba, so kind of fun to have one that I don't think you're gonna be able to find. Well, I know you won't be able to find it anywhere else. That continues this way. And now we run into another salvia. This is Wisa Wee. And Wisa Wee is a great uh, kind of darker purple variety. And that has um, some Spirobolus heterolepsis mixed in here. That's prairie drop seed. And there's quite a bit more prairie drop seed up on this end. So that's all sort of blended through here. Now that echinacea actually pushes into this corner um, because apparently echinacea can actually handle a little bit of shade. And this, this side of things is a little bit shadier, a, a lot bit shadier actually. Over here we've got Stacky's Humalo. Uh, great plant, also can handle some shade. And that's basically this whole corner is that Stacky's. Now the one area we haven't talked about is right here on this side of this pagoda dogwood. You guys remember this pagoda dogwood came out of the containers that I was growing in the driveway for a couple of years. It's doing, it overwintered really well. It's, it looks like it's doing great. It's all budded out. 
This is gonna be geranium macrorrhiza, big root geranium. I told Roy not to bring any of those because I have a ton of them around to put in here. So that's what will get filled in here. We've got a few alliums sort of sneaking in there as well. So when Roy added in these few little things like the Nepeta, Subsessilis, and the uh, Sanguisorba, there's also a Ver uh, Veronicastrum down there. Nice, tall, spiky, white plant. Um, when he added those in down in that corner, he did that very, even though there were grasses called for that corner. The reason he did that is because I've got a really terrible weed here called uh, reed canary grass that has come from farm fields and has seeded itself along my creek. And I'm working to get rid of that. And so there's a little area of it over there where I'm still working at it. And he purposely didn't plant any grasses near that so that it would be very easy to spot where it is because you don't want to let it run because it'll just take over the whole thing. So I thought that was a great little designer tip of, you know, you can, you're going to have to keep working on that weed for a little bit. So let's not plant anything there that you might confuse with it looks a lot different. So that's how we ended up with those plants kind of down in that corner. The last thing we're going to do is um, we're going to plant some Carex bromoides in the bottom here. Um, Roy didn't really lay those out because there's a little bit of cleanup I have to do in that area. But we're going to actually run those all, they will handle quite a bit of wet. I'm going to run those all the way to the bottom and actually some of those will be right along this creek, even in the creek, because they will, they will handle that just fine. The good news is we've had a lot of rain this spring, so the soil is sort of a nice amount of moisture and it's been, hasn't rained for a couple of days here, so it's not too wet, not too dry. So I think plants are going to plant really well in this and of course I've actually I'll water everything in when we're done but I think there's nothing to do but get stuck in first. So I've got all the salvia crystal blues planted that was the first thing that went in but I realized I didn't talk to you about how I prepared this soil. Our native soil here is very sandy. This area was sort of woodsy for a lot of years so there's naturally a lot of leaf mold that's been worked through here and humus and so it's sort of a light woodlandy soil over here but when we had work done over here on the septic, they really tore this area up. So we had to come through with a topsoil compost blend and fill in the gaps and even the whole area out, which is why the soil looks really nice on the top. Some areas have just maybe a half an inch. Some areas are really thick with it. That's why you see what you see here. I did also come through and put down a little bit of biochar blend. This is an already activated biochar and biochar is great for your soil. It A, lightens it up. It also um, helps nutrients stay in there. It's got a lot of um, really good minerals in it. I've been promising you a whole video on biochar and we'll get to it. But for now, just know that I've been using it for several years and I am convinced that it's why my garden that I planted two years ago grew in as well as it did is because of the biochar. There's no scientific proof to that, it's just what I think. Other than that, there's nothing going in this soil. I'm not putting in any kind of starter fertilizer. I'm not doing any of that. And one of the reasons I'm not doing that is I feel like this soil is right for these plants. And that's actually part of the reason these plants were chosen. And it's because all of these plants like a little bit leaner soil. They don't want a super rich soil. Um, so I don't think between what's already in this soil, I just don't think that it's necessary to go adding in a bunch of starter fertilizer. Everything they need in terms of mycorrhizal fungi and all of the things they need to get growing are here already. So there's no need to add anything else. Okay, back to planting. So I just wanted to show you this. So some of these grasses in particular are really quite root bound. This in this one, including it. So um, what I'm doing is I'm just trying to break those up. You guys have probably seen this before. And actually, if I had a knife on me, I might just slit them because it's easier and my hands are starting to get a little tired. So it's hard to do that, but it is important to just get those broken up. Um, clearly this plant is gonna take off. So I don't need to worry. You know, treat it with kid gloves in any in any way there so anyway if you pull a plant out of a pot 
and it kind of looks like that. Just break that up a little bit and get them heading in the right direction, which is out or down, and uh, it'll be good to go. Here's another plant I wanted to show you. This is the Coreopsis Golden Showers, and Roy was talking to me about this plant and said it does spread about a little bit, and you can see this sort of runner right here. It's sort of red, and you can see where it comes out there. And he said the thing with these is that they only go out a couple of inches and then they stop. So here we go. So you can see what's going to happen when that stretches out. But it doesn't get super crazy. I'll be honest, I am always a little wary of uh, Coreopsis because I had kind of a bad experience with one once. It just moves slowly and it's easy to chop out of there if you want to. So anyway, that's just something to look for when you're looking at plants. You can see how it's going to... It's relatively shallow rooted and you can see it's just gonna run, you know, a little bit beyond the plant. You can see the roots coming down. So that tells you a little bit about something about how this plant grows. Well, it's not wine and weeds, it's wine and planting, I guess. When the projects move into cocktail hour time, there's nothing to be done about it, but to pause a little bit for a quick refreshment before you keep going. Well, let me give you guys an update of where we are because it's several days later now. So I actually wrapped up this video, did the goodbye, did the whole thing without finishing up the planting. And it's been working at me because I didn't feel like that was fair because it wasn't done. So what I did do was get uh, yesterday unfilmed, uh, planted the seven or so pots that need to be planted on the steep slope using uh, the spade and got those in. And now today, I'm just going to finish up with the geranium macrorhizum, which just goes on this side of the pagoda dogwood because it can handle whatever shade develops there. So I'm planting um, Ingwersen's variety of geranium macrorhizum. Uh, geranium macrorhizum is one of my top five plants. It works in every situation I can think of. It's a fabulous ground cover. It crowds out all the weeds. It's hardy as heck. Some of them get some really good fall color on them. I don't know what more you can ask for. It does get a flower. You can see this one's got kind of a light pink flower on it. Now I do have a tray of another variety called, I don't know what it is, bright something, but it's supposed to be a really intense bright pink. It's not here yet though. So what I'm going to do is leave a few little gaps and put in a few of those amongst this. I feel like if you plant an entire flat of that in one spot, it might be too much, but I think mixing it up would be good. So I'm just going to put these in and then we're just going to do some final wrap up on this because I want to talk a little bit about this theory of how close all these plants are planted. That was the easiest part of this whole project. That was great. Whew. Feel really good about having that done. You can actually see in the distance. I think there's some pots around. We've got a lot of other planting to do, but everything else I'm doing around here, I'm basing off of what Roy and I did here. I'm trying to sort of filter some of those same plants into those gardens um, to make this whole little bit cohesive over here, but doing a few different things as well. So a couple of notes on what's next here. First of all, I've really been going back and forth on mulching. I mean, the whole idea of planting plants this closely is that they grow together quickly, so you don't have to do things like mulching. So, because the plants are the mulch. The plants become the mulch. They block out the light so you don't get weeds. And then when you cut them down in spring, after you've left them standing in fall, you leave all the parts of the plants behind and uh, that becomes the mulch. And so whatever has been taken out of the soil is going back into it. And you don't have to get into this cycle of getting wood chip mulch, which I kind of hate. So I am going to mulch this. Um, there's a lot there, even though we planted these plants closely, there's a lot of space between them. So, but I'm going to use uh, leaf mold instead of, I do have a whole bunch of arborist chips. I'm not going to use those for this. I'm going to use leaf mold, which I think um, will be better for these plants and, uh, and more appealing to me, to be honest, and it's easier to spread. So I'm going to use that instead. Uh, we'll have to keep up on the watering, you know, first year garden, especially when things are planted this intensely. I'm going to have to just keep up on the watering for the whole summer. That's just my job here is to do that part of it. So Roy and I were talking about, you know, the theory behind planting. This is an intensely planted area and there's a lot of plants in here. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, how is that possible for someone to be able to put that many plants in an area? And Roy and I sort of talked through that. And, you know, I'll tell you, you can kind of 
look at this two different ways. One, you can plant an area intensely and then you spend your time for the first year basically just watering it and just watching those weeds in between for one year. By year two, they've probably mostly grown together. By year three, they probably will grow together and you'll actually be adjusting things over time. Versus a thing where you plant plants uh, either farther than their mature spread will be or um, with the hopes to fill them in later or divide them later um, or at where their mature spread will be. And then what do you do? Then you spend three years weeding, weeding and weeding and weeding. And I don't care for weeding. So part of the idea of this is that they grow together more quickly and you can spend your time editing them and doing what Roy always calls the gardening part of this, where you get to make the decisions of, is something taking over too much or do I need some of this over there? And you can fine tune this planting rather than spend your time weeding it. All of that said, I realize that this kind of intense planting is perhaps not fully realistic. And Roy and I talked about that too. And Roy did point out that many of these things can be grown from seed. So you could start planning for a garden like this a year ahead of time or two years ahead of time. Uh, and then you could grow a whole bunch of these things by seed. And that way, once you grow plants from seed, that's pennies. That's, that's pennies. It's pennies plus time is what it is. Or you could plant a little bit wider apart. And I think you could throw in some annuals that you've grown from seed that might reseed around and you can pull those out later. In fact, I think that annuals mixed in with perennial plantings are really great. You guys know I do that all the time. So there's different ways to approach this. All of that said, I really like this idea of planting things closely. And I think if I were beginning in this garden again, I would take a look at just focusing on one area at a time and planting that really intensely and getting that looking exactly the way I wanted and then moving on to the next area. So I just wanna say thank you for following along with Roy and I on this garden journey. I really hope you guys have learned um, something that you can take away from this and apply to your own garden because that was the whole point of this entire series was Roy spends all this time on his channel helping people understand plant patterns and plant relationships and plant partnerships. Um, but I wanted to show you in a manageable space how you translate that into an actual planting. And I hope we've met that goal because that was the goal the whole way along. I've not been as excited about a garden as I am about this one in a really long time and that's a great feeling. So I hope you guys are doing something in your yard that you're really excited about this year. In fact, tell me about it in the comments. But more than that, I just really, really hope this was helpful for all of you and that you're gonna maybe find something in this to take away to put into your own gardens. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for following along with Roy and I. Um, there is a playlist that I will link at the end of this video. So make sure if you missed a part of this, you can start from the beginning and see where Roy and I started. Cause actually even in these few months that we've been doing this, it's a pretty dramatic difference. All right, thanks for following along on this mega planting session. Have a great day in your garden. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.